to Bharata First. You're watching Big Picture with me, Frank Rouse and Pereira. Since you're here, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and share the video so that more people get to know about us. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. If you like our content, please contribute to keep it alive. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. Let me also inform you that we have some massive discounts at the Knowledge Center and we will be closing registrations for the existing packages soon. This is your last chance to get these offerings. I will be taking live big picture current affairs analysis soon as well, so don't miss out on that. Go to kc.bharatafirst.com and register right now. Hundreds are reaping the benefits of the Knowledge Center. Don't be left behind. All this information along with some must-see recommendations are in the description of the video. Please go through it. And now onto the discussion. External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar had a fruitful first quadrilateral meeting with his counterparts from the US, Israel, the UAE on ways to expand economic and political cooperation in Asia, including through trade and enhancing maritime security. Jay Shankar on a five-day visit to Israel was accompanied by the Home Nation's Foreign Minister Yair Lapid during the virtual meeting on Monday. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and UAE's Foreign Minister Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nayan participated virtually as the four leaders also exchanged views on shared issues of concern in the region. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze the Foreign Minister's visit to West Asia. Joining me on the program today are K.P. Fabian, former ambassador, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, foreign editor of the Hindustan Times, and Professor Swaran Singh, School of International Studies, JNU. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Ambassador, let me start the program with you first. Let's analyze the key highlights or takeaways from the Foreign Affairs Minister's visit to West Asia. Let's focus on Israel first. Good. Well, uh, the media have been reminding us that it is the first visit as a foreign minister. But uh, as Dr. Jayashankar himself said, it was the third visit in four years. You know, he was addressing the Indian community. Incidentally, many of them are from Kerala. And uh, I too had visited them some time back. And uh, so now, I see that uh, you mentioned about the Quad, the new Quad. Well, that was an important development. Um, of course, there are many aspects about it. To what extent it will be focused or directed against China is a question to be discussed. Because uh, let us not forget that uh, UAE if I'm right, China is the biggest trade partner. And even for Israel, Haifa port, a part of it, Netanyahu had given to Shanghai uh, Port Corporation International, I mean, a Chinese company, some time back, much to the chagrin of the United States. So to what extent Israel would like to be seen as uh, ganging up against China, we have to see. As regards relations between India and Israel, well, they are deep, they are strong, and they are getting broadened. Because I don't think they can be deeper, you know. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we are also talking about an FTA. So... But uh, what I noticed is that the media did not speak much about the defense relationship, which is actually the linchpin. As you know, even before we established a formal, you know, embassy relationship, well, Israel had been courting us, Cargill, and even 62, Jawaharlal Nehru had written to Ben Gurion for arms and ammunition. And Israel has always responded handsomely. So, but I'm not surprised that the media didn't mention it because as I said, it's very strong and very deep and uh, it is progressing. You don't have to talk much about it. Absolutely. So on the whole, I think, you know, it is a very important visit and uh, this quad thing has to be watched very carefully. Absolutely, absolutely. Professor, let me come to you now. You know, uh, let's talk about the visit and let's talk about the key focus areas. One, of course, is uh, uh, 
the issue of trade. And, uh, you know, India and Israel have decided to take forward a free trade agreement. I'm surprised that we don't still have one, you know, <laughs> the, the, the relationship is so deep and strong. And we waited so many years to even pro to see this much of progress as far as, uh, you know, an FTA is concerned. Do you see that going in the right direction? How much is the change of guard in Israel going to have an impact on ties with India or the bilateral relationship as a whole? I think I want to underline the, the Abraham Accords uh, that happened uh, from August to December last, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, in some ways transforming uh, regional alignments uh, in the entire region, uh, which was earlier seen as uh, Iran on one side, Israel on the other, and of course, uh, Sunni Emirates and kingdoms uh, on the third side. Of course, Egypt and Jordan had uh, engaged uh, Israel much earlier. But regional alignments are changing. That's uh, one part where India now has to deal with the uh, you know, Emirates and Israel more or less on one side in, and Iran on the other. India has to balance that relationship. Second, we are also shifting here from uh, you know, the strategic triangles to uh, quadrilaterals uh, from Japan, India, Australia, US, Japan, India, and so on. And now what we see United States as it is kind of upsticking its uh, engagement with West Asia uh, and focusing and pivoting towards uh, East Asia, where China's challenge is slightly more emphatic compared to China's challenge in, uh, in, in, the, in West Asia, as Ambassador Fabian just underlined. Uh, it is creating those quads. On East, we have quite a little security framework or dialogue where India, United States, Australia, Japan are together. And now we have this quadrilateral for West Asia, where India and United States are same, we now have UAE and Israel in that sense. So United States is reorchestrating re uh, these uh, alignments uh, to gradually ensure that uh, other countries are involved in that uh, creating and management of security architecture. India apparently is getting a much uh, sort of uh, visible and perhaps more uh, uh, bigger role because India is uh, partnering with the United States, both now in East Asia and West Asia. Uh, India's relationship with uh, uh, Israel has primarily, again, been uh, defense-centric, as Ambassador just mentioned. That, again, is being reorganized and expanding to now. You have uh, known that they've created this International Forum for Economic Cooperation, and that is going to create an extension senior officials working group on the same subject to explore opportunities for energy, climate change, pandemic, and other issues to be added on to not just defense-centric relationship, which is, of course, the core as of now. And in that sense, I think this is also extension of that, that at bilateral level, uh, foreign minister is saying that we will now start FTA negotiations in November. And because the relationship is uh, pretty thick so far, we could actually sign one by middle of next year. And indeed, uh, all four foreign ministers of US, UAE, uh, Israel, and India are perhaps expected to meet in person sometime in Dubai Expo, which is going to continue uh, till March next year. So. Uh, what I am underlining is the reorchestration of the entire relationship, where India apparently is getting a little more traction, visibility, and engagement. Uh, and therefore, it's not just India's excellent relationships we have built in last decade with all you know, uh, countries of the region. But now we are shifting up and, you know, and linking them to you know, regional level alignments. So it's a very different kind of uh, orchestration which we are noticing driven by United States, but I think apparently enormous role for India, which is, uh, which is visible. How far we can actually cultivate and exploit and harness that opportunity, uh, we will have to wait to see that. Absolutely. Uh, Pravit, let me bring you in now. You're talking about this opportunity. How big an opportunity is it for India, considering that we have uh, great ties with all the nations in West Asia and especially uh, the Gulf countries. And uh, do, do you also get a sense that the United States is losing interest in the region and is looking for other partners too to take forward its agenda, especially in West Asia? Well, the first part, I think, uh, yeah, what we're seeing is India in, in with this new agreement. Uh, we in the media call it a quad, but the government of India has been very careful not to refer to it as the quad. In fact, none of the other three members have. There's no defense component in this new relationship. Um, what India has been able to do is combine, effectively merge two different West Asia relationships. The one with the United Arab Emirates, which has been prospering quite dramatically in the past four or five years. 
um, well, actually even longer, well, six years now, um, and of course the existing one with Israel. Both of these relationships have been increasingly moving away from an original uh, sort of base. So the UAE one was built around migrant workers and a certain degree of oil. Now is increasingly about investment uh, and technology. Um, the Israeli one, again, began, as the others have mentioned, with defense that continues to be strong, but increasingly now is also about different things. When you talk to Israeli officials, they're very clear that 50% of their conversations with Indian officials now, including the prime minister, uh, is about water, because India, Israel is a superpower in water technology, literally in every variety of water technology, Israel is miles ahead of everyone else in the world. And we are a severely water stressed nation. They're also called, as you know, the startup nation because of their incredible capacity uh, in startups, venture capital. And that's another area we're trying to, we are now increasingly working together. So these actually, there's a convergence now between India's policy with the UAE and India's policy with Israel, combined with the fact that the UAE has changed its own policy in the Middle East. It was originally took the Saudi line to be extremely confrontationalist with Iran. It's now moving to a very different policy uh, of engaging with Iran. So in many ways, that combined with the Abraham Accords allows India to then become much closer publicly with both the UAE and Israel without having to worry too much about the fallout with other countries in the Gulf, notably Iran. So that's where I think that's going. You're completely right on the, on the United States. I think if you look at the interim national security guidelines issued by the Biden administration in March, they very clearly lay out that the Biden worldview in many ways overlaps with the Trump administration's worldview, that America's number one challenge is China. Uh, and it has essentially now only three areas of core interest, the Indo-Pacific, the European continent or subcontinent, uh, and the America. And after that, the rest of the world is really of secondary importance. It is noticeable that it completely meant, did not mention Central Asia or Southwest Asia, preparing the ground for the withdrawal from Afghanistan. It also brings down the Middle East and makes it clear that America's commitments to the Middle East no longer require the degree of American involvement that it did in the past. And in fact, the Middle East is now put roughly on par with Africa. Africa actually gets a bigger mention in the Middle East in the security guidelines. And I would, I think, I would argue if you look at Biden's speeches, a very similar message is said. America has to retrench given it's facing a, a challenge like China. Um, and the Middle East is no longer of that great importance. So allowing other countries, other partners of the United States, notably the UAE, Israel, um, to some degree, Saudi Arabia, or the Biden administration has some tension with the Sauds. Um, to move into that space is something that the Biden administration is more than happy to allow. Absolutely. Um, Ambassador, taking the discussion forward now, you know, since we're calling it the new quad, what shape do you see it going forward? Because security and, uh, uh, you know, uh, security is a big aspect in this particular region, but there is no defense dimension given to it yet. So what shape do you see it take, taking? Well, I do not know. As so already mentioned by Professor Saran Singh, you know, the senior officials are going to sit down and work out things. But at the same time, I will be surprised if there is any security stroke military overtones to that cord because uh, as i said earlier israel which will not like to be seen as ganging up, ganging up with others against china nor would for that matter the uae let's get it right as already mentioned by promit uh, you know the United States has recognized China as its single, what shall I say, important challenger. Correct. But even there, United States is uh, in a state of uh, ambiguity. We know that uh, Biden asked uh, Xi Jinping for a summit meeting. Now, anyway, that I thought was a strange thing for a state head of state to ask another head of state Let's have a summit meeting. You know, diplomacy is changing. When I was there, it should have been the 
job of the ambassador to find out when is it convenient to meet. You don't just, you know, and the state doesn't ask the other. But Biden's style is different. He asked Putin. Anyway, that apart, I personally doubt whether there will be much security stroke military dimension. And even regarding trade, as I said, the trade links of uh, UAE with uh, China are very strong. So, but uh, still, there can be much uh, useful uh, coordination in terms of uh, supply chain, you know, and uh, even trade, so long as it is not seen as anything directed against anyone else, you know, and it can be played. After all, diplomacy is dancing with more than one partner at a time. And uh, as I see it, India is getting slightly better at it than it used to be. So you can do that. But uh, at the same time, I would say that uh, we have just seen the baby born. Now, <laughs> you know, there will be, you know, a lot of uh, care taken to make sure that the baby grows. So let's wait and watch. Let us not come to conclusions in advance. Absolutely. Professor, what challenges do you foresee for these this quadrilateral grouping going forward? I think they have a large number of challenges. I'll put the first one on uh, not being seen creating any defense-centric uh, alignments within themselves. Uh, in that sense, uh, that there are two, three things very quickly I can share with you. One, uh, I think United States, which is the mover and driver of these initiatives, has understood India's uh, reluctance to be part of any security alignments. Uh, same thing happened in case of quadrilateral security framework on the East, in East Asia, where now they have started AUKUS as a kind of a complementary new alignment to address that sensitivity of the United States. You would remember speeches of Mike Pompeo. And, uh, you know, India was at variance at that time. India stays at variance. And I think that same lesson will apply far more effectively in case of West Asia, in case we want to call it a quad. Because members of Quad in West Asia are far more dispirited, separate, and varying. In fact, sworn enemies at time. So, UN and Israel, of course, are very different compared to Australia and Japan. So, security alignment within them uh, is, I think, is not easy thing to happen. Also, I think both Israel and uh, the UAE would be looking at opportunities beyond being either, you know, defense-centric engagements or energy-centric engagements. They are both looking at other engagements of critical technologies, startups, tourism, climate change, all kinds of other areas where they want to also encourage economic relationship and investments. Uh, that is why if you see the first initiative that they have taken is to create international group for economic cooperation. And it is only for that they have decided that senior officials will be uh, creating a working group on the same uh, theme so that they can explore what, what are the options where these four nations can really begin to work together. So I assume it's not necessarily going to be defense-centric focus, uh, uh, particularly because that is how India looks at its alignments. United States accept India's uh, reluctance on that subject. And there are more difficulties of bringing uh, UAE and Israel together on any security alignment. So I don't see, just like for a long time, you know, in the East, the Quad was called Asian NATO, and now people stop talking about it. Here in West Asia, there is a question of kind of a West Asian NATO being created. Bilateral relationship, of course, remains firmly grounded, at least between US, Israel, and Israel, India on defense centric cooperation. But as was just mentioned, there are a lot of other areas agriculture, irrigation, technology, startups, where India and Israel are also, you know, there are, I think, about three dozens of those advanced centers of technology that Israel already has in India. So in that sense, Israel also is trying to expand its relationship and in that sense become more acceptable and widely engaged in the region. Otherwise, it's a tiny country. I mean, it's one fourth of uh, New Delhi NCR. I mean, population, wise it's a very small country. GDP, of course, is impressive. But even GDP is one sixth of that of India. Technology is what attracts people. Technology is enormously advanced when it comes to Israel in certain areas of water management, irrigation. That it wants to hard sell now. And I think, therefore, this, even if you call it quad, 
will be far more widely based in terms of its agenda and focus much more on areas of which are beyond defense centric uh, alignments now, defense centric alignments i think will remain in, in remain in bilaterals whether it is india united states or india israel but they are both expanding india us also talks of now of course we have spoken of it for last decade that we want to take the bilateral trade to 500 billion we kind of said it again now but you know that is the focus that we need to build advanced technologies partnerships expand economic and investment cooperation between them so that is the kind of focus i see that quad is going to have have but i agree uh, you know that there are going to be challenges it's it's the baby just born as ambassador just mentioned we'll have to see how it takes shape you remember the quad on the east had died very soon after it was started in 2007 and of course it was revived much later only in 2017 so these things are still uh, you know things we need to take with lot of caution i understand that government of india is not calling it quad as of now because the resemblance could lead to further speculations but i right. would say that the, this is redefining the alignments fundamentally in terms of how they are being calibrated that is significant whether the outcomes are going to be quickly in front of us i, I would put more caution on that absolutely uh, pramit coming back to you now you know now that this particular quadrilateral grouping has been formed let's not forget the, the equations in west asia too are constantly changing and there is turkey also in the mix who's trying to put forth its own agenda do you see uh, more like minded countries coming on board and maybe you know uh, expanding this new quad that has been formed one of the issues um, in the briefings that we've received so far indicates that connectivity is going to be one of the key elements of this new relationship um and if you see the indian the indian uae uh, along to some degree with saudi arabia um and oman have been working on a trade a food corridor between india and the persian gulf and persian gulf now is one of our biggest export markets for food items in fact during the pandemic we were the primary provider uh, of bulk commodities of food commodities to to the persian gulf and the uae is rebuilding on that further uh, there now is a, a railway being constructed between the uae through saudi arabia all the way running to the port of aqaba in jordan uh, and then further connectivity through that to israel and then from there to greece uh, and all of these countries are working on that that idea and the, the point of this entire structure is that if iran is going to control uh the area from lebanon all the way through syria iraq uh, and uh, and it's and iran itself um the arab uh, emirate countries obviously want uh, to have a backup uh, structure uh, so that they are not dependent uh, only on the persian gulf and the straits of hormuz for a lot of their commodity movement um in addition greece and israel uh, and egypt are in a different struggle with the eastern mediterranean against in about the control of the resources there so they are also interested in developing a second rung uh, connectivity structure uh, this is not a defense thing again it's largely about ensuring that you're not dependent on supply chains running from through countries that you will have problems with in the, in the in in the later times um india is more than happy to join any of these projects but the point is that the ones through iran have struggled because the iranians have not been interested in the north south corridor um <clears throat> afghanistan of course is impossible to work through and pakistan obviously has no interest in allowing connectivity between us and the rest of of central asia so this works perfectly well for us so that's going to be one of the big movements there that we're going to be seeing coming out the country that's missing right now in this four country relationship is saudi arabia Uh, because that connectivity doesn't work without Saudi Arabia and there i think the problem is the united states um the us biden administration is extremely hostile uh to saudi arabia uh, jamal khashoggi the journalist who was killed by the saudi uh, security system is a very close friend of a lot of the members of the biden administration among other things so at some point i think that's going to have to be resolved somewhere or another and saudi arabia saudi arabia brought in and i think the uae and india will push that iran be allowed to share into some of this that there's no point keeping iran out if you want to build connectivity but as long as you have an alternative path there's no reason why iran 
which does funnel a large amount of its, its oil uh, export, especially its illegal oil exports and its oil financing via Dubai, uh, should not be part of this at a, at a larger, broader stage. Right. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, time to get quick closing comments uh, from all my panelists with uh, you know, what's in stake for India in West Asia and how should we proceed going forward, starting first with you, Ambassador. Well, I want to take forward what Pramit said, and uh, I think it was a very important point that I Iran should not be excluded. Very important point made. And uh, I want to share with you what we say have. Historically, after the Soviet Union collapsed, China and Russia got together. They got even closer together when uh, Putin annexed uh, the Crimea. And uh, G8 became G7. Now, I f believe that Iran is going to join that. As you know, China has already signed uh, a $400 billion over a period of 25 years to invest in the energy and infrastructure sectors in Iran. And Iran is negotiating a long-term contract also with Russia. Biden has been as slow as, uh, what shall I say, as slow as slow can be about resuming the JCPOA. And I personally think he's making a big mistake there. So look at the map, Russia, China, and Iran. And we all know, wherever China goes, it takes Pakistan with it. And now Afghanistan, for the time being, controlled by the Taliban, beholden to Pakistan. So we, we are looking at the possibility of an axis linking Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, and uh, Afghanistan, and this North-South corridor, which India wanted, I think uh, we need it still badly. Even what is being suggested, this uh, railway line and all that is no substitute. So let us hope, and mention has been made about the possibility of, uh, you know, UAE and Iran sort of, you know, talking to each other, they are talking. And even Saudi Arabia has been talking. So if Iran can be brought in, then India will have the North-South corridor, transport corridor, and all that, you know, mentioned already. So that is the best scenario I hope for. Absolutely. Professor? Uh, there is no doubt that these four countries uh, have certain amount of uh, shared interests which has brought them closer. Uh, but we have to be also very well aware of the variance in the views of all these four nations. Uh, so far, this entire West Asian region was seen as a, you know, reference to three kind of points of reverence, Israel on one side, Sunni Emirates and kingdoms on the other, and Iran on, on the other. Uh, Sunni Emirates and kingdoms and Israel were all close friends uh, over a period of time of United States, but they were not talking to each other so much. It has happened over a period of time, and this squared is you know another inflection point where Sunni kingdoms are coming closer to Israel. Now, Iran could feel kind of marginalized uh, with this kind of initiatives. That is the challenge India has to make sure that uh, our engagement with Iran is not completely, you know, decided by some other forces, but by India's own national interest. We do not want to see Iran, China, Russia, Turkey, Malaysia coming on the one side and, and these uh, Sunni kingdoms, Emirates and Israel and United States, India coming on the other side. Because increasingly, the way United States is orchestrating, orchestrating in these regions, India is expected to sort of bear much greater responsibilities, build its bigger engagements in the region. So in that sense, India will have to be careful that this alignment of uh, Sunni kingdoms over a period of time with Israel, United States and India on board in that formation uh, doesn't really push Iran to the wall in that sense, because India and Iran also have had long-term relationships. It's a strategic partnership that we have, I think, from 2001 onwards. We have sustained it more or less. But this realignment uh, should not mean that, you know, there is a negative impact on uh, Iran and Iran sees itself being pushed further to China, Russia, Malaysia, Turkey, etc., and Pakistan included. Uh, that kind of bifurcation is going to make it uh, far more uh, sort of dangerous uh, equation of instability. 
uh, India will have to make sure that we contribute whatever we can, that that kind of bifurcation doesn't become glaring and stalking uh, kind of bifurcation, that certain amount of alignments continue to be uh, with you know, all these countries that India has had so far. Also, you know, the, that quad could also, you know, find ways and means to engage other nations. There could be mechanisms of inviting uh, special invitees or observers, dialogue partners, so that there is a sense of, uh, you know, wider net of uh, engagement here and not just, just four countries coming together, which again is something India has always said. India is in favor of either militarizing regions or creating clubs which are exclusive to few nations. So that is the standard line India has had on these issues. And I think right. we have to make sure that we are able to stand that when it comes to West Asia, the way we stood in East Asia. Absolutely. And Pamit, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, this new arrangement has to be seen as also part of the fact that India's economic interests now are very clearly aligning with those with the countries of the West. Uh, our the type of technologies we want to do, the digital economies we are creating, um, the, the type of infrastructure, the new trade policy we're trying to create uh, is all built around these new alignments that we're trying to do. So, for example, on the FTAs, we are not good at FTAs, but the new attempt to do FTAs, we are now looking, we're clear, we're not joining almost any FTA that has China uh, inside of it. Uh, there's no attempt to even develop or everything is possible to try to reduce our economic relationship with China. But we are trying to negotiate an FTA with the Gulf Cooperation Council in which Saudi Arabia and the UAE are at the heart of. We are trying to develop uh, now sign re renegotiate our, or restart our FTA negotiations with Israel. And as I remember this entire point of this economic corridor so far goes all the way up into Greece, which is a member of the European Union, which is another part of the world. We have now restarted our FTA negotiations. So you can actually see the infrastructure uh, and the political alignments and the FTAs all coming in at the same path. We're, we're trying to sit down and put them on top of each layers on top of each other. Uh, and I think that's a very clear plan um, from what the government of India is trying to do. Um, so where our economic future lies, I think we're doing, we're moving all in the right direction. One of the problems we have with these other countries, uh, as I said, China and Pakistan were not interested in developing an economic relationship. Uh, Russia, we basically just have a defense and an energy relationship, partly geography, it's simply too far away for us to deal with. Uh, Iran remains crucial, but Iran, one of the problems we have on the economic front is that other than oil, we have almost nothing else to do with each other. Um, so it's important strategically, but it doesn't fit in so far with the economic policies of the government. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Well, what's coming out of this discussion is that ever since the Abrahamic Accords were signed, things have been rapidly progressing in the region. India is now openly becoming closer to Israel and the UAE without having to worry about antagonizing others. The US is losing interest in West Asia and is reorchestrating alignments to suit its needs. It's looking for partners to carry out its agenda in the region. This is a massive opportunity for India. The new quad grouping is in a nascent stage and there are bound to be challenges. Those challenges, however, don't outnumber the shared interests. That having been said, the focus of the new initiative will not be on security and defense, but will have a wide-based agenda on economy and several other issues. Now, before I go, let me once again remind you to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and share the video so that more people get to know about us. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive information. If you like our content, please contribute to keep it alive. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. Let me also inform you that we have some massive discounts at the Knowledge Center and we will be closing registrations for the existing packages soon. This is your last chance to get these offerings. I will be taking live big picture current affairs classes as well very soon, so don't miss out on that. Go to kc.bharatapas.com and register right now. Hundreds are reaping the benefits of the Knowledge Center. Don't be left behind. All this information along with some must-see recommendations are in the description of the video. Please go through it. That's it from me. See you again next time.